Welcome to Bizval, where we make business valuations simple. It's a party in the front and business at the back with a set of straightforward questions for you to answer. Our clever algorithm runs the numbers and dishes out an approximate valuation of your business. We don't claim that every valuation is a perfect answer, but in practice, valuations are both an art and a science anyway. And we know that because our team has years of experience in investment banking and valuations. What we do know is that we are making professional valuation methodologies accessible for entrepreneurs at an absolute fraction of the cost of hiring professional services firms. Our 80-20 approach means that an 80% accurate valuation can be achieved with 20% of all the potential inputs, making this a powerful tool for entrepreneurs and for accounting firms looking to service their clients with something a little bit different and perhaps a little bit more interesting than just the annual financial statements. The Bitval podcast is our way of introducing ourselves to you and explaining why we are doing this. We will also be discussing some of the intricacies of the model, which manages to be simple yet advanced at the same time. We also hope to bring you plenty of practical insights to help you create value in your business. From me, the finance ghost, welcome to Bizval. Welcome to this episode of the Bizwell Podcast. I'm your host, The Finance Ghost, and it's a pleasure to be here with Jonathan Kropp. He's an IT entrepreneur. He valued his business on Bizwell. And those of you may have noticed that if you valued your business with us in September, you had the chance to win a podcast with me. I don't know if that's much of a reward or not, but here we are. Jonathan, I hope you enjoy it. And I think we're going to chat a bit today about your journey as an entrepreneur, the business you run, an exciting expansion to the UK, which is pretty cool. And then your thoughts around, you know, why it's important for founders to actually know what their businesses are worth. So first off, welcome to the show. Thanks for the time, Ghost. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So you are in the UK at the moment, which uh, these days is almost an emerging market. No, I'm kidding. So it's, uh, it's always fun to tease, you know, just because we've suffered for so long with the RAND. But of course, you are South African. You know, you are well acquainted with the world of load shedding, the RAND and all of these things. Because historically, you've lived here, you've built businesses in South Africa. Your current business is Velocity Group, but it is by no means your first, is it? How many have there been before this? Yeah, well, I mean, first first off, in, in the UK, everyone seems to have a heart attack when the exchange rate moves like 1%. Um, clearly, they've never done business in, in South Africa. So, um, yeah, it's not as bad as everyone makes out. Um, yeah, so Velocity Group was the first business I started, but within Velocity Group, we started multiple other businesses and other ventures along the way. Um, so yeah, 2007, I started Velocity Group. It was uh, three of us. That, Great market timing. <laughs> it was, right it was exceptional <laughs> market timing. Yeah, it was, I think I think I actually, I think I, it might have been two days after I resigned from quite a cushy corporate job in a, in a big IT company in South Africa that uh, Lehman Brothers... You know, there's all the images of people packing their boxes and, and leaving and, you know, the, the kind of financial crisis hit. And I guess that, 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 that was like an interesting start because you've just resigned. You know, I took uh, one, of the, one of the three partners at the time was, was one of my best friends um, and he actually funded the startup of the business. So now I've taken money from my best friend. The, the other partner was resigning his job. Um, and we had the kind of global financial crisis. Um, so we had to do some f- fancy footwork at, the, at that stage to say, well, you know, what is our value proposition going to be? And how do we turn this um, kind of worldwide catastrophe into something that we can use? Um, I guess that's the, the eternal entrepreneur in, in me is saying, how do we flip that around? And we did. You know, we, we went out and we we traded on that Velocity brand and created a value proposition to customers at the time, which was we'll deliver your IT infrastructure quicker um, than what you used to because we, we came up with some some cool ways of doing that. And at the same time, we could save money because of the, the way we did the logistics. We could get it to a customer quicker. We could save them money. And then that saving money message was became quite strong, especially in the time when, when companies were all of a sudden holding onto cash and didn't want to, to spend as much as they they ordinarily would have. Yeah, I find personally when the macroeconomics are broken, it really hits the big companies because for them, you know, they've kind of already done the, the hockey stick growth. They've already got a couple of hundred customers and inevitably in a big downturn, all of them pay back a little bit and then it really hurts. But when you're a startup, 
you can sort of duck and dive and navigate these things. And if you get it right, you can actually do quite well because you're bringing something different at a time when things are very broken. And ultimately, you're coming from zero. So if you get to 10 clients by the end of that quarter or year or however your business works, you just need a tiny, tiny market yeah. share and you're making exactly. money, right? Yeah. People forget this. That's that's it. And so 100%, when, you, when you're starting from zero, you know, that, that infinite, you're in an infinite growth stage because when you add one customer, you've added 100% more than you had the day before. So that's all you have to do is you kind of have to just focus on adding a customer at a time or... Um, just getting your your business out there and starting to to trade because momentum builds. It's, it becomes like a you know trying to stop a steam train. I suppose even if you put the brakes on, that momentum carries. So you just got to do that, and that's what we're doing in the UK at the moment. We're facing that that exact kind of of situation, which is interesting. So 15 years later, I'm sitting in the UK starting up a, a UK branch of the business, and. <laughs> Funnily enough, the UK economy has taken a massive, massive dip at the time we're doing it. And uh, yeah, we've got the same, exactly the same challenge. Now you do manage to get the market timing right. I should give you some money to look after. And then I must just fantastic. do exactly the opposite with much bigger amounts. And then uh, net, net, I'll yeah, well, make money. 100%. I've always said I, I, should, I could probably make money selling uh, market timing advice to people. So basically, you know, if you just watched my share portfolio, whatever I've bought, you just sell. And vice versa. As soon as I mean, I Jim Cramer buy, makes a living like that. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's definitely really scope in the market it. for this. I should really monetize it. <laughs> so, speaking of monetization, Velocity is all about hybrid cloud. Now, I'm not sure everyone understands what that means, and I'm hoping it's more exciting than hybrid cars, which are definitely not exciting at all. So, what is hybrid cloud for those who perhaps don't understand it? Just briefly. Well, I mean, if, if you go back to the fundamentals of everyone will have heard the name cloud, and, and cloud gets associated with something like uh, you know Apple iCloud, where, where stuff is stored up in the cloud. And basically, that's what cloud is, is that you're utilizing someone else's servers and services to, to run your business or to run an application or to store information, whatever it may be. And you know, there's a couple of really big providers of cloud, the, the big names like Microsoft, AWS from Amazon, um, Google, of their, their, they're known uh, as hyperscale cloud providers because they just have this massive scale that nobody else can touch. They've got the money to do it. Um, there's some smaller regional players that, that have their own clouds and, and things like that. But generally, it's the, the hyperscalers that people use. Um, and then hybrid cloud is, uh, take a step back, about 10 years ago, it was just like cloud was going to be the only place you, you had information, the only place you did anything as a business and as a consumer, and that's definitely not played out. So what hybrid cloud means is that you've got both your existing kind of legacy type of of way that you stored and used information and accessed it. So, you know, you might have a pastel server or a, or something like that on installed on your at your office, and then you're using other services from uh, the hyperscalers like Microsoft. You might be using Microsoft 365, um, you could be using some Azure servers and services, and that means it's hybrid. It means you've got a mix of both. And that sounds pretty simple, but getting those two worlds to work together where you've got information sitting in both places can be quite tricky from a, a security perspective, from an access, from connectivity, um, all of those things. And so that's really where we come in is making sense of that, that hybrid cloud world helping customers who already have issues in terms of hybrid cloud or helping others move to the cloud. So that's that's where we are now. It, it was different when we started. When we started, it was very much, we just supply stuff. And that was that was easy. You know, if you wanted some compute, as we, we call it, you know, if you wanted a server, I delivered you one in a box, done. I, I got the money and you paid me 30 days later, all sorted. Now, there's nothing to deliver physically. We never even see the stuff. It's all accessed remotely and you pay monthly for it. So a little bit of a, a business model change. Yeah, something we've seen in tech across the board over the last decade. I guess an analogy for hybrid cloud is almost like, you know, retail. There's the more traditional bricks and mortar stuff and then they have an e-commerce side of the business and it becomes this omni-channel thing where you need both, right? It's You can't just be one. That's it. So yeah, absolutely. In retail, it would be termed omni-channel. Um, so if you want to liken it, it's, I guess it's omni-cloud. There we go. We've invented a new 
term today. This is what tech people do. They invent yeah, new terms gonna, and they don't use capital I'm letters. Gonna, well, I'm going to trademark that and I'm going to start marketing it. So, Please, please do it. Now, OmniCloud will probably turn out to be the worst market. Now, you'll probably cause the next market crash by trademarking something. Please, I think for all of us, rather, well, <laughs> rather don't. Well, it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting you say that. So in, in the tech space, and, and you, you go back to, you know, I've started multiple businesses, in specifically all in the tech space, really. And we've had some successes and we've had some, you know, great failures. Um, but we've always, a lot of the time we've been the leaders in something. So the early, the early adopters, you know, coming out with things like we had our own public cloud service way before, you know, most people in South Africa did. Um, we did lots of things like that. We, you know, we, we, I want, we started a CRM business doing Microsoft CRM products and we called it XRM. So anything relationship management versus customer relationship management. And nobody was calling it that. Nobody had that kind of term going. And then all of a sudden, other people started to. Um, so we have a good ability to see the trends and get involved. But I think if I've learned anything over the last 15 years is that getting in early is not necessarily what you should do for success. Mm. Um, sometimes letting other, people's, letting other people learn and build a market and coming in afterwards and doing, that, doing it very well is, is a better thing to do. Kind of more Steve Jobs ish than um, Bill Gates, I suppose. <laughs> I wish I had their wealth, but yeah. Some good advice in there. So, some of those businesses that were a big success within the sort of velocity stable, were any of those ever sold or are those businesses that you still own today? Yeah, yes, yeah. So, I mean, we've been through the cycle of buying and selling. So, uh, we had a small copier business which we sold, didn't make you know huge amounts of money off it, but we, we, we tried to get into that print business, didn't really work. Uh, managed to sell it uh, without losing any money, which I think was a, a great, uh, great result. And then um, one of the businesses that we took a really big bet on was in the cloud space. So we started um, a business called Cloud on Demand, and we really looked at it and said, you know, we're consuming a lot of cloud from uh, cloud providers, whoever they may be. We're paying all the money out. Surely there's an opportunity to just put in our own infrastructure and build our own cloud. And when we looked at it, we, we kind of immediately saw that, yes, we can do it. Technically, we can do it, um, but we need some scale. And the only way to get scale was to potentially have a channel. So that's why it was called Cloud on Demand and not part of Velocity as we, we actually kind of had uh, split it out that we could go to our competitors and offer them our cloud platform in a way that um, meant that we weren't competing with them as a cloud platform because, you know, we could consume from IS, we could have consumed from MTN, AfriHost, but all those people would sell directly to the customers as well. So you ended up as a, as a partner of those companies, you ended up competing with the vendor, which was very, very difficult. So yeah, we, we saw the, that that was our, our opportunity to kind of do something cool. Um, I mean, at the time we were coming off the back of pretty strong growth, yearly growth in the business. Um, we were young and naive, I suppose and thought it would last forever and we we really chucked the kitchen sink at, at that cloud business unfortunately the growth in our core infrastructure or the, the core velocity business tapered off so we were faced with a situation where we had now really invested a whole bunch in this cloud business uh, our traditional business was was tapering off for various reasons and um yeah we were in a bit of a tough situation where uh, we needed more capital to chuck into the cloud business, but didn't actually um, have it at the time. So we looked for a partner. Or we looked to we initially looked to sell the business um, to exit, and there was value in it. We had built a nice a nice business, um, but then along came a one of the, the large technology distributors, Tarsus, which is now part of the Alviva Group, and they saw the opportunity to move from their typical hardware distribution business and create something of of value around services. And uh, they bought a 50% stake in the business and put up some um, investment capital for us to, to actually grow it out, um, which we did. You know, I went across from the business I started, uh, the original business, Velocity Group. I went to, went to Tarsus and headed up Cloud on Demand. Um, and we built it into a very, very significant business. I think today it's the biggest cloud, um, it's the biggest cloud distributor in, in the country. 
I'd probably even say on the continent. So very successful. So they owned 50% of that. And after two and a bit years, they saw the potential of what was what was happening with it. And they kind of came to us and said, look, guys, um, this is a journey we want to do on our own. And we saw the opportunity to to exit and, and get a pretty good return. And we did it. We took it um, and successfully got out and you know, put a few million in the bank. And we were quite happy about that. No, that's brilliant. So people always say, you know, I'd never invest in junior mining. It's too risky. But actually startups are almost exactly the same, right? You start with this sort of dusty patch and somewhere underneath there is a resource of some kind. And, you know, I end up reading, I don't understand much about junior mining. You really have to be a geologist to know what's going on there. But I picked up a lot from reading Sen's announcements and writing about them in Ghost Mail. And it's all about getting to the point where you can like confirm the resource basically and then raise funding against it. And then often, you know, another partner will come in at that point in time and actually create the viable mine. Everything that happened before that was just the exploratory yeah. work, which is actually really risky, but also has arguably the best returns in the entire value. You know, if you can take something from 100%. absolutely nothing to being a resource that can start to bring metals out of the ground, that's where the very best returns are made. It's also where the most risk is. Startups are exactly the same. Startups are just junior mining, right? You're doing exactly that and you get to a point where, okay, we've got a great idea, but either there's not enough capital or it's too hard to distribute because you can't, you know, you just don't have a big distribution partner who already has a client base. And then at that point in time, that is exactly the right time to actually bring someone else in that plugs that gap, you know, and that's where M&A is just so powerful if you can get it right. A hundred percent. I think that also the, the trick is, is, you know, when, you, when you're in a startup or you've started a business, uh, people tend to get really emotionally involved with it. Um, you know, it's my, my baby. I can't sell it. That kind of attitude. But it, you know what are you doing it for are you doing it as a lifestyle business where it's just going to you know fund the way you live and that's how you want it forever if that's the case fine then treat it as such if you're going to do it as a an investment vehicle or some way that you know that's your retirement or you you want to make some some money to exit that you can't be emotionally attached you know you've got to watch for when the timing's right and uh, and take the right deal you know i guess we could have held on if we wanted to i don't know what the result would have been but maybe that the you know our partner wouldn't have invested the same kind of money to get the result that they have today if we had still been involved um, because they wouldn't have been owning 100 percent of the business they would have only had 50. Yeah, and the other lesson in this is a staggered deal can often work really well yeah, so i've been watching absolutely. how transaction capital did the we buy cars deal you know you start I think they started with a non-controlling stake and then moved into control. Then they moved to kind of around 75. Now they've got a structure that can take them to 100. Or the founders have got the ability to hand on to, I think it's around 10% into perpetuity. I'm going to get some of those percentages wrong, but the principles are not wrong. And some of the best yeah, deals yeah. I've ever seen are these sort of staggered approaches because it just works for everyone. You know, it means you bring the partner in and now, much like in junior mining, you don't want to let go of the entire resource once you know it's there. You still want to hand on for the next phase of development get that next bit of value uplift, even if you only get half of it, and then potentially let yeah. the whole thing go. Likewise, for them coming into the business, by having you stick around, you know they are also de-risking their investment because you're still in this together. It's not a case of you selling them everything and disappearing, you know, disappearing to the Caribbean. They are with you here, and you're going to keep growing it with them. There's a lot of M&A tactics around this stuff, which is you know my old life in corporate finance. It's something I personally really enjoy. And too many founders get it horribly wrong. It sounds like you definitely didn't, but a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, and it's how we, so when we bought, we bought a small services business in 20, well, okay, I called it four years ago. I can't remember the actual year, 2018, 2017. Um, and we did it the same kind of way. Okay. We took a, a bigger initial stake. We I think it was 75% and the, the existing team owned 25%. Um, but they saw the potential because we, we were an organization that we were pretty good at marketing and the business side of it. They were good at technical. Um, they saw that their 25% could be worth more than the, the 100% that they had in the first place. Um, and kudos to them. It, it is, you know, they, they took that gamble and it, it worked. So we look, you know, initially we looked after the sales and marketing and business side of it and helped grow that, that business, bought one of those partners out, um, one still involved with a small stake. Um, in that in that division, but it's, uh, it's it can be a really good way to do it, and it can be a good way to build value for for entrepreneurs who may have started a business, 
but they aren't sure how to take it to the next level. So they want something more, but can't really get it there. You know, taking on a partner could um, could help alleviate that, and, and we shouldn't be too scared to do that. Yeah, it's good advice. So now you're in the UK, so you've got a lot of experience in you know doing deals before. What is the game plan there? Are you going to do it organically, or are you going to look to buy some kind of foothold in the market and then grow from there? It, it kind of was undecided when we moved across. So the idea was to to for, for me to move across and and get get a lay of the land and understand the market better. And and I think it's the right way. So we didn't move across and say we were just going to we're going to buy someone or we're going to move across and hire. We're going to move into the market. And we're going to hire ten people. I think we we went to the right approach, which was we don't know. Let's get across there, see, um, speak to people, understand the market. Because when you you're on the ground, it's very different to the theory of it. Um, so now we now you know we've been here for a good few months uh, since March or so. Uh, we've got customers on board organically already. Um, which is great. So if you go back to the the, the original uh, the original discuss, part start of the discussion, we've, we now do have customers here in the UK. So looking at well, we can potentially carry on to get the to get more customers uh, because the business model is good. We can service those customers with South African cost base because, like we said, cloud is cloud is remote. Uh, we never see a server with the remote into it um, to do the work. So we can do that from South Africa. So there's a compelling, um, really compelling argument around that. And now with the, the UK economy faltering, I think that becomes back to, you know, I'm coming full circle back to where we started and saying that we can offer um, a superior service to customers in the UK at a, ch- I don't want to say cheaper rate, a more cost-effective rate. Because when you're talking about services, you shouldn't talk about cheap, I suppose, but a more cost-effective rate. And that, that probably will resonate with the market here. And then at the same time, we're looking to to acquire um, you know, some smaller businesses in the UK um, to give us that kind of base to to work from and get and and get going at some kind of scale. And also, I mean, I will say we we're also looking at acquiring in South Africa. So, you know, you know, there's businesses in South Africa that would be very complementary to what we do around security, um, networking, those kind of things that uh, we currently outsource or we use partners to do. Uh, we definitely would look to to acquire in South Africa as well. So, you know. We're basically trying to grow the business, um, and we'll do that with, in whichever way makes sense. And inorganic growth, which means acquisitions, is a tried and tested strategy for IT companies, right? Most of the JSC listed IT businesses have been built through, yes, organic growth, but lots of acquisitions along the way, and it just makes sense because you're just buying services you bolt onto what you're already doing. It, it is one of those industries yeah. where you logically can grow through acquisition. And and I guess just from a, a pure for those who aren't you know necessarily like finance type of people, uh, you know I'm not a finance person, and at a business level it makes sense. You know, an acquisition makes sense for the the really the sole reason that if I need ten million rand to do an acquisition, I can go to a bank and get it. If I go to the bank and say I need ten million rand to start up a division, I'm not going to get it. You know because there's no asset to buy. They're just going to give you a you know what kind of a termed loan maybe, and they're not going to give you the same kind of amount. And then from a financial perspective, you know, you're going to sink that 10 million rand probably into expenses, make your profit and loss look, uh, and ultimately your balance sheet potentially look a lot worse than if you just bought someone in the first place and use that as a base to build. I can't remember which US company it was, but at some point I read an earnings announcement and the guys talk about investing through the income statement, aka losing a lot of money on a new division. Yeah, and then you end up with you know st- income statements or, or financial results. They talk about normalized revenue, and they try and split that out. Normalized adjusted you know, EBITDA before one source. Normalized earnings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Before one source, this that next thing. You know, it's like well, they're just trying to split out the fact that they've lost money trying to do something. So since we've gotten some of the financials now, I mean, you did a valuation through Bizval, and hopefully it was an enjoyable yeah. experience. I'm quite proud of what we've built here. And I mean, it's very much, we're definitely still a startup. There's going to be a long way to go in terms of getting it to where we believe it can go. What made you do a valuation? I mean, are there reasons for a founder to do a valuation, in your view, beyond just selling your business or buying one? Is it something that you think is just important to know? You know, when you go to bed at night, at least you know you've built something of value? I think... Yeah, look, I mean, the reason that that I did it was was multi was kind of multifaceted. So the one was yes, you know, I've been dedicated the last fifteen years of my life to this thing. Is it worth anything now? You know, I I think it is. 
emotionally certainly it is, and at a, at a financial level, is it actually so to try and just um, make myself feel better about you know what I've what I've dedicated my my career most of my career to now, um, and then also to say well you know if we did have to um, go out and acquire businesses, what is the value of ours right now, and you know how can we use that to raise capital to potentially buy um, buy other businesses. Um, and then also to look at it from a, you know, if we ever want to do some kind of staff investment scheme or we want to bring on other other shareholders and directors, where are we? What are we talking about in terms of, of what is the magnitude of that? So multiple reasons, really. Yeah, that makes sense. So obviously, from our side, what we believe we've done is we've created a tool that allows an entrepreneur like you to get this answer. I'm not going to say cheap because you've taught me that saying cheap is a bad word, but certainly affordably. Uh, versus, for yeah. example, going to one of the you know really large audit firms. I don't know if you've ever been through a valuation process like that, or is this kind of the first one you've been so, through? So, no, so I have. So when, when we sold Cloud On Demand, we had to do the valuation. I mean, the biggest, the, the, the sole shareholder of Tarsus at the time was Investec. So you had a bunch of bankers doing the valuation. And then the auditors, which were PwC, I think, had to get involved in the second transaction to uh, come up with a value. And that was, I mean, it was, it was hugely painful, hugely. And hugely expensive. Massive. I think, I mean, the amount they spent on just determining the value uh, and came out at exactly what I said it was. So, you know, <laughs> I wish they'd just give me that money instead. <laughs> so I'm laughing because I know, like I genuinely know, I know from my previous life in banking, I've seen this play out so many times. I know how those models were built because I used to build them. And yes, there is complexity, make no mistake. But so many times, you know, financial services firms are charging for their brand credibility. No one gets fired for hiring IBM. You know, there's a tech example that will irritate you and resonate with you at the same time. And in truth, when they're doing stuff like, you know, huge cross-border transactions where there's going to be reliance on it by the South African Reserve Bank and, You know, if there's ever a query by SARS and it goes to court, you know, look, in those situations, even I recommend rather use one of the big names. They've got the people who can, you know, rock up in court that day and back it up and they've got the insurance for this. They've got all of that in place. That's not what we do. But for a founder like yourself, you know, looking to understand what is the business worth? Maybe I want to sell a bit. Maybe I want to bring a partner on. Hell, maybe I don't. Maybe I just want to confirm that I'm on the right track. Maybe at some point, you know, one of the next iterations of what we're doing is a sort of scenario planning tool that's coming relatively soon. What's quite fun with that is to say, okay, you know, my, my business is worth X million today to make it double that size. What do I need to do? Is it as easy as doubling revenue? Often it's not, you know, often it's a bit more nuanced than that. It depends yeah. on your margins. It depends on discount rates in the valuation. So those become, it becomes a business management tool. I like to think as opposed to just a piece of paper. Yeah. hundred percent. So, you know, you always want to know the end goal. So I, I know what my exit value is for our business. Uh, unfortunately, it's a large number. <laughs> so so we probably will be, you know, building the business uh, for a while until we get there. But everyone has a number. You know, you, you can say you don't, but everyone does. There's that number where somebody walks, comes along and says, I'm going to give you uh, whatever, $50 million for your business. Uh, you know, I'm fine. You know, that's, that's then I'm, I'm out. But how do I get to that number? So whatever the number is in your head, how do you plan to to get there over a certain period of time? What do you need to do to do that? And if you're flying blind, it's it is very difficult. And that scenario planning tool would be very cool. Absolutely. So, last question or or last thought from you, because I think we're pretty much out of time. The listeners to this are busy entrepreneurs themselves. You've walked a, a long and difficult road over the last sort of 15, 20 years, whatever it is. What advice would you give to an entrepreneur who's not just starting up, but someone who's kind of now maybe a couple of years into it? The honeymoon period is over. They've realized this is this is a slog. You don't just wake up and create a business that two years later makes you gigantic money. I mean, you read those stories sometimes out of the US, but on average, that is not how it works. And just any thoughts you've got for someone in that situation yeah, that's, listening to that's, this? 100%. You know, when, you, when you're sitting faced in that situation, a few years down the line, I, I would say, have just sit down and relook. What are you good at? What are you not good at? And then find a partner to to help you. So if I look at the, our business today, if I didn't have um, Clayton, Clayton Porter, who's one of our, our shareholders now, if I didn't bring him on at the time, we definitely wouldn't be sitting where we are today because I have a great ability to run around and do stuff 
and he has a great ability to come with his broom behind me and sweep up that mess that I'm I'm creating and turn it into something a little bit more um a little bit more process orientated and um more admin you know he's got that admin orientation to him versus me who just goes barreling along like a bull in a china shop half the time um so yeah we definitely wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have him and it was a big decision at the time you know bring on another partner should we do that yeah i don't want to give up my 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 shareholding and you know don't worry about it if if you believe the person's going to add value give up your you know not all your shareholding obviously but give up give up a percentage to to get that person on board if you if you believe they they'll change your business and they'll help you and free you up to do the things that um you can that you're good at and that you want to focus on i remember one of my clients in my previous life always said to me there are only three roles in a business that's it sales finance and us that's it and when he looks yeah. to buy a business he always looks at the ceo and says you know has the ceo identified the blind spots because nobody is very strong at all three. I've never in my life met someone who's very strong at yeah. all three. If you are lucky, you are strong at two. Being strong at two is a very talented person and a very talented person can also be extremely strong at one. But then you've got to recognize the blind spots and you have to have either a partner or a very, very strong executive who you treat like a partner and remunerate yeah. like a partner who covers off those blind spots because two creative people in a business exactly. will break it. They'll do cool stuff, but it'll break. Yeah. Two ops people will just yeah. never grow, for example. And too many finance people in the room won't have a product. <laughs> they'll, they'll know how to like, yeah, manage well, it, but there's well, no product. That's it. And they'll all be sitting around working out how to save money when there's no money coming in the door. Yeah. So. These are the joys of business. Yeah. This is what uh, makes it exciting, though. For sure. Keeps us going. Yeah, it certainly does. So, Jonathan, I just want to say thanks for your time. Thanks for valuing velocity on Bizval. I'm glad you had a good experience and it's it's really encouraging, I think, for us as Bizval to hear, you know, it resonating with you as a customer in the way that we hoped it would. You know, it gives a really good answer at a really affordable price in a really easy process for busy founders. That's what it's for. And obviously, if anyone listening to this podcast, firstly, I'm going to direct you to Velocity now if that's something you're interested in, but go and check out Bizval. Go and see how it works online. Reach out to us. Go and do a valuation. And Jonathan, for those who are interested in finding out more about Velocity as a business, maybe someone's listening to this from the UK, for example, or has some ideas for you, or is just looking for a new hybrid cloud sort of service provider, whatever the case may be, where do they find you? So quite easy, uh, web address, www.velocitygroup.global. Um, and then my email address, Jonathan K at velocitygroup.global. Easiest. Wonderful. That's it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank the you. time. And uh, so we'll stay in touch. Great. Cheers.